Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 47. In this lecture, we'll discuss degrees of freedom and the equipartition theorem. These topics are covered in Chapter 21 of our textbook by Surway and Jouette. Before getting into the main topic of this lecture, I want to remind you that thermodynamics is essentially about the study of the internal energy of systems. So when you look at a cup of water sitting on the table or an empty box sitting in the corner, you might think that from a mechanics point of view, there isn't much happening there. But if you zoom in down to the microscopic level, you'll see that there's actually a whole lot of activity on the microscopic level. The H2O molecules in that cup of water are actively moving. Some of them might even be rotating, some might even be oscillating, and there is some energy associated with this activity. That empty box sitting in the corner, it's probably filled with air, and those air molecules are moving at hundreds of meters per second. There's a whole lot of energy associated with that motion, and thermodynamics is essentially about understanding and quantifying these types of energy. So we might talk about thermal kinetic energy if we're thinking of the three-dimensional motion of molecules. We might talk about rotational kinetic energy if we're thinking about the rotational motion of molecules. And if the molecules are oscillating, like this carbon dioxide molecule shown at the bottom, then there's going to be some vibrational kinetic energy and vibrational potential energy associated with that molecule. The sum of all of these energies is collectively referred to as internal energy. And our goal in this lecture is to understand and precisely quantify that internal energy. To better understand and quantify internal energy, let's talk about heat for a minute. Recall that heat is the change or transfer of internal energy. There are three main mechanisms for heat. They are thermal conduction, thermal radiation, and convection, which we've discussed in a previous lecture. For now, we don't care too much about the exact mechanism for heat. Instead, we're interested in the following question. When you heat a system, where does the energy go? Or equivalently, when you cool a system, where does the energy come from? So when you put a pot of water on the stove, for example, and heat it, thereby adding internal energy to the water, where exactly on a microscopic level does that energy go? And if you put that water in the refrigerator and cool it, thereby taking energy out of the water, where does that energy come from? Quite generally, energy is stored as molecular kinetic and potential energies. So we're talking about the same types of energy that we talked about back in our mechanics course. However, we're now talking about the energies of individual atoms or molecules stored on a very microscopic level. As I mentioned on the previous slide, there are different types of energy. We can talk about thermal kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, vibrational kinetic energy, vibrational potential energy, and it turns out there are other types of energy as well, but these are the main ones that we're interested in for now. Each of these types is referred to as a degree of freedom. So for the rest of this lecture, we'll talk about degrees of freedom, or DOF, quite a bit. When I speak of a degree of freedom, I'm essentially talking about a type of molecular or atomic energy. And when we say that a molecule has many degrees of freedom, what we're really saying is that a molecule has many different ways that it could store energy or that it possesses many different types of energy. Our long-term goal is to quantify the degrees of freedom for different materials and from that calculate the total internal energy of those materials. So let's dive into the details now. We'll start our discussion with the simplest molecule imaginable, the monatomic molecule. The monatomic molecule consists of a single atom. Once we've understood the monatomic molecule, then we can graduate to the diatomic or triatomic molecule. Here we're going to model the monatomic molecule as a simple sphere. We're interested in the energy that this molecule could have, and in general, if this molecule is, let's say, a gas molecule inside a box, it can be moving. More specifically, it could be moving in the x direction, in the y direction, or in the z direction. 
Associated with this motion is some kinetic energy, and we can express that kinetic energy as one-half mv squared. v here is the magnitude of the velocity vector of this molecule. To distinguish this type of motion from other types of motion that we will soon see, we're going to refer to this velocity as the translational velocity of the molecule. Translation in this context simply means moving from one place to another. That motion can be in the x direction, in the y direction, or in the z direction. Since the velocity vector has three components in three dimensions, we can use the three-dimensional Pythagorean theorem to express the magnitude squared of that vector simply as vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. We can now separate this energy basically into three distinct portions, and we can refer to each one as a type of kinetic energy. So we can talk about the x translational kinetic energy of the molecule, the y translational kinetic energy, and the z translational kinetic energy of the molecule. Writing the kinetic energy in this form might mislead you into believing that kinetic energy is a vector. Kinetic energy is not a vector, it's a scalar quantity. Here I'm simply choosing to break up that kinetic energy into three distinct chunks. So for example, if the monatomic molecule has 10 joules of kinetic energy, I might say that two joules are associated with motion in the x direction, and three joules are associated with motion in the y direction, and let's say five joules are associated with motion in the z direction. The implication here is not that kinetic energy is a vector. I'm simply suggesting that the kinetic energy can be separated into three distinct components. We refer to each one of these components as a degree of freedom. So we would say that so far this monatomic molecule has three ways it could store energy, and therefore it has three degrees of freedom. Now, in principle, this molecule could do other things as well. The molecule could be rotating. If we are in three-dimensional space, then the molecule could be rotating around the x-axis, or around the y-axis, or around the z-axis. The molecule, of course, could be rotating around some diagonal axis as well, but that angular velocity could be expressed as a linear sum of the three angular velocities that I've described here. Associated with that rotational motion is some rotational or angular kinetic energy, which can, which can be expressed as one-half I omega squared. Here, I refers to the moment of inertia of the object, and omega is the angular velocity of the object. In general, for rotations around different axes, one needs different moments of inertia. So if the object is rotating around the x-axis, we should talk about the x moment of inertia. If it's rotating around the y-axis, we should talk about the y moment of inertia, and similarly for the z-axis. So when we break up this energy into three pieces, we should be careful to talk about the x component of angular velocity and the x component of moment of inertia. Now, since we're modeling the atoms as spheres, it turns out I sub x, I sub y, and I sub z in this context are equal to each other, so we can replace all of them with simply I. Now, it turns out the energy associated with these three types of motion is basically equal to zero simply because the moment of inertia for an atom is negligible. A little more precisely, we could say that the atom is being modeled as a sphere, and the moment of inertia of a sphere can be calculated to be 2 fifth mr squared, and the radius, the size of an atom, is quite small. When you take that very, very small number and you square it, you get an even smaller number, so the moment of inertia is very nearly zero which means that all three terms here in this expression are going to be equal to zero. So for a monatomic molecule, rotational motion is not really a significant source of energy. Nearly all of the energy of a monatomic molecule is associated with these three degrees of freedom. In summary, we would say that the degrees of freedom for a monatomic molecule is equal to three.
as you will soon see, this counting of the degrees of freedom is going to be very important for calculating the total energy of a gas that consists of a large number of such molecules. You may have noticed from our discussion on the previous slide that the moment of inertia of an object plays an important role in determining the energy of that object. So here I just want to do a quick review of the concept of moment of inertia, which should already be familiar to you from your mechanics course. Recall that the moment of inertia of an object is a measure of its resistance to angular acceleration. So an object with a large moment of inertia is going to be very difficult to spin up. An object with a small moment of inertia is going to be very easy to spin up. It would be easy to impart angular acceleration and therefore angular velocity to such an object. To calculate the moment of inertia of a continuous body, we would use this formula here. In this formula, dv is referred to as a volume element. It is equal to dx times dy times dz. So this integral here really is a multivariable integral. It's a triple integral to be exact. Rho is the volume mass density of the object, and r perpendicular is the perpendicular distance between this volume element and the axis of rotation that we wish to consider. Now for our purposes in this class, we don't really need to calculate this integral. If you've taken a course on multivariable calculus, you may have evaluated this integral. For us, what's important is that this integral can be used to evaluate the moment of inertia for a variety of interesting shapes. If you look in your textbook, you'll see a table there that lists the results of the evaluation of this integral for a variety of shapes. For us, what's most important is really this equation down here. Since we're modeling atoms as spheres, really the only thing we need to know is that for a solid sphere rotating about an axis that passes through its center of mass, the moment of inertia is equal to 2 fifth mr squared. If this material is completely unfamiliar to you, at this point you may want to pause and review this material in your mechanics notes. So now let's return to our discussion of degrees of freedom. We've already discussed the monatomic molecule, so now let's discuss the diatomic molecule. The diatomic molecule consists of two atoms bonded together. As before, we'll model the atoms as perfect spheres, and we'll model the bond between them using a rigid rod for now. Once again, we're interested in the types of energy that this molecule could have. If this molecule is inside a box of gas, then it could be moving in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Associated with that motion is some translational kinetic energy, which can be expressed as 1 half mv squared. V here is the magnitude of the three-dimensional velocity vector of the molecule. Using the three-dimensional Pythagorean theorem, we can write that magnitude squared as Vx squared plus Vy squared plus Vz squared. In this way, we're dividing the kinetic energy into three components or three pieces, which we will refer to as the x, the y, and the z translational kinetic energies of the molecule. Notice that the analysis so far for the diatomic molecule is identical to that for the monatomic molecule. The diatomic molecule can also be rotating, more specifically, it can rotate around the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. Associated with that rotational motion is some angular kinetic energy, which we can express as 1 half i omega squared. In general, rotations about different axes must involve different moments of inertia. More precisely, for rotation around the x-axis, we need an x-moment of inertia. For rotation around the y-axis, we need a different moment of inertia, and similarly for the z-axis. Now at this point, the analysis becomes a little more complicated, simply because we need to recognize that I sub x is equal to I sub z for the diatomic molecule. What I'm saying here is that roughly, uh, 
rotations about the x-axis look identical to rotations about the z-axis for this diatomic molecule. A little more precisely, rotating the molecule around the x-axis is equally difficult as rotations around the z-axis. So we can denote both i sub x and i sub z using the same number, which we'll write as simply i. Now it turns out i sub y is basically equal to zero. The reason for that is that when we rotate the molecule around the y-axis, we're basically rotating each atom around an axis that passes through the center of mass of that atom. Now recall that for a sphere rotating around an axis passing through its center of mass, the moment of inertia is 2 fifth mr squared. Our atoms are very small objects, so r is a very small number, and when we square it, we get an even smaller number. So the moment of inertia for rotations around the y-axis is essentially zero. So we would say that there is negligible energy associated with that rotation. This means that the angular kinetic energy of the object, of this diatomic molecule, can be reduced to essentially two terms, and we'll refer to these two types of energy as the x-rotational kinetic energy and the z-rotational kinetic energy. Note that the y-rotational kinetic energy is basically negligible. It is nearly zero, so we don't need to consider it in this context. So far, we would say that the diatomic molecule has five types of energy or five ways in which it could store energy. So, so far, we would say that the diatomic molecule has five degrees of freedom. Now, it turns out the diatomic molecule has other ways that it can store energy as well. So far, we've talked about how the diatomic molecule can move in the x, the y, and the z directions. Associated with that motion are three degrees of freedom. The molecule can also rotate and associated with that rotation are two more significant sources of energy. So that's two more degrees of freedom that this molecule has. Now it turns out that the bond that holds the two atoms together is never perfectly rigid. Given enough in energy, this bond can be stretched or compressed. So a better model for the bond between two atoms is a spring. If the bond is very strong, like a covalent bond, then we would model it using a very stiff spring. If the bond is a weak bond, like a hydrogen bond, then we would model it using a soft spring. The point is that as this spring gets stretched or compressed, there is going to be some potential energy associated with it. Recall from your mechanics course that spring potential energy is given by this expression here. X is the extension of the spring relative to its natural or equilibrium length, and K is the spring constant. It describes how stiff or how soft the spring is. Of course, as the spring or the bond is stretched or compressed, the atoms themselves begin to move, and there is some kinetic energy associated with that vibrational motion of the atoms. So in summary, we can say that there are two more degrees of freedom. As the spring is compressed or stretched, there is some potential energy associated with it. We'll refer to that as vibrational potential energy. And as the bond is stretched or compressed, the atoms move, and therefore there is some kinetic energy associated with that motion, we'll refer to that as vibrational kinetic energy. Now it turns out that these two additional degrees of freedom are active only at high temperatures. In other words, these two sources of energy are significant only when the temperatures are relatively high. The reason for that is that for most diatomic molecules, this bond is quite strong and very difficult to stretch it. For example, uh, oxygen molecules are diatomic molecules, and the covalent bond between the two oxygen atoms is quite strong. Ordinarily, at room temperature, let's say, when oxygen molecules move around in air, the bond is nearly fixed in length, and so there is almost no spring potential energy associated with the bond. However, at very high temperatures, let's say above 1,000 degrees Kelvin, 
then the collisions become quite violent and forceful and there is enough force in those collisions to actually start extending the spring. As the spring then becomes extended, stretched or compressed, there is going to be some potential energy and some vibrational kinetic energy associated with the molecule. So we often say that these two additional degrees of freedom are active only at high temperatures. In summary, we can say that for a diatomic molecule, we ordinarily have five degrees of freedom and two additional degrees at very high temperatures. Now, exactly what counts as a low temperature or a high temperature depends on the exact molecule you have in mind. That information is usually provided in the context of the problem. Let's summarize our discussion so far. We've been counting the degrees of freedom for different types of molecules. Each degree of freedom is basically a source of energy for that molecule. Each degree of freedom is a way in which that molecule can store internal energy. A monatomic molecule can store energy in three ways. There are three significant sources of energy for this molecule, and those three sources are the three translational degrees of freedom that we discussed. A diatomic molecule can store energy in seven different ways. There are three translational degrees of freedom. These are associated with the motion of the molecule in the x, the y, and the z directions. There are two rotational degrees of freedom. Here, the molecule does not have to move very far from the origin. It could simply rotate in place. And then there are two vibrational degrees of freedom. So even if the molecule is not moving overall, so if the center of mass of molecule is at rest, even if it's not rotating, it could still be vibrating relative to, let's say, its center of mass. And in that case, we would say there are two vibrational degrees of freedom. The last two degrees of freedom are active only at high temperatures. We can summarize all of this as follows. We can say that for a monatomic gas, D, the degrees of freedom is equal to three, for a cold diatomic gas, so a diatomic gas at relatively low temperatures, D is equal to 5, and for a hot diatomic gas, D is equal to 7. You may be wondering why we've spent so much time counting the degrees of freedom for different molecules. The answer to that question and the main subject of this lecture is the equipartition theorem. According to the equipartition theorem, in a gas at temperature T, each degree of freedom of each molecule stores an amount of internal energy equal to one-half kBT. The equipartition theorem is basically describing the equal division or distribution of energy. Note that the equipartition theorem is saying that energy is divided equally among the degrees of freedom, but not necessarily among the molecules. So the equipartition theorem is not saying that each molecule gets the same amount of energy. It's saying that each degree of freedom of each molecule is getting the same amount of energy. Each degree of freedom is getting basically a specific unit or chunk or quantum of energy, which is equal to one half kBT. KB here is the Boltzmann constant and T of course is the temperature of the gas. The equipartition theorem is important because it enables us to calculate the total internal energy of a system. Specifically, given n molecules at some temperature t, the total internal energy of that system is equal to the number of molecules times the degrees of freedom per molecule times this magic quantity of energy that each degree of freedom gets. If each degree of freedom is getting energy equal to one half kBT, and we multiply that by the degrees of freedom per molecule, we find that the energy that each molecule in the gas gets is d one half kBT. If we then multiply that by the number of molecules, we find the total energy of the gas. This expression is also sometimes expressed in this form in terms of the number of moles and the gas constant. You can prove the equivalence between these two expressions by noting that R 
is equal to the Avogadro number times the Boltzmann constant. We discussed this fact when we were discussing the ideal gas law. Now moving forward, we'll often be interested in the change in the internal energy of a system. And this expression here tells us that the change in the internal energy can be expressed as Nd one half times the Boltzmann constant times the change in temperature. So throughout a thermodynamic process, we're going to assume that the number of molecules does not change. We're going to assume that the type of molecule does not change. So for example, diatomic molecules remain as diatomic molecules. So D does not change. Kb, of course, is a constant. So the only thing that could change is the temperature. And now we have a convenient expression for how internal energy changes in terms of the temperature. This is going to be important for us because if you recall, the first law of thermodynamics states that the change in internal energy is equal to the heat that was added or subtracted plus the work that was performed on the system. So now we have an independent way of calculating the change in internal energy. And by equating this expression here involving temperature and this expression here involving heat and work, we can calculate quantities that we could not calculate before. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem using the equipartition theorem. A vessel contains gas that is a mixture of 100 molecules of type A and 100 molecules of type B. The mixture is at a temperature of 600 Kelvin. At this temperature, each type A molecule has 3 degrees of freedom and each type B molecule has 7 degrees of freedom. Although it's not going to be important for us, you can already guess that these type A molecules are probably just monatomic molecules because they have 3 degrees of freedom. And you can probably guess that these type B molecules are probably hot diatomic molecules because they have 7 degrees of freedom. For part A of this question, calculate the total internal energy of the gas mixture. For this calculation, you may need the Boltzmann constant, which is equal to 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. We can calculate the energy of type A molecules using the equipartition theorem. We'll take the number of type A molecules, multiply it by the degrees of freedom that they have, multiply by one half kbt t must be in kelvin and of course the temperature is given to us in kelvin so there's no conversion required there and we find that the type a molecules have a total internal energy of 1.243 times 10 to the minus 18 joules we can do a very similar calculation for type b molecules the number of type b molecules is also 100 the degrees of freedom is 7 We'll multiply that by one half kbt, and we find that type B molecules have 2.9 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The question asks for the total internal energy of the gas mixture, so we now need to add these two energies. We find that the total internal energy of this gas mixture is approximately equal to 4.143 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Continuing the same practice problem, part B asks, what fraction of the total energy belongs to each type of molecule? We've already figured out the energy for type A molecules and the energy for type B molecules. By adding these two numbers together, we find the total energy of the gas. To find the fraction that belongs to type A molecules, we simply divide EA by E total, and we find that it is equal to 0.3, that implies that 30% of the total energy belongs to type A. Similarly, we find that 70% of the total energy belongs to type B. This is interesting because the number of type A molecules is equal to the number of type B molecules. Since there are 100 uh, molecules of each type, naively you might expect that each type has exactly 50% of the total energy. However, that's not the case because the two types have different degrees of freedom. Type B molecules have more degrees of freedom, so they possess more energy at a given temperature. 
if energy were wealth and these molecules were people, we would say that the energy is not equally distributed between the two types of molecules. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.